With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, Driscoll is named as one of the world's most innovative companies of 2024. We'll have more on that. We start today with the Fungicide Resistance Management Minute brought to you by Corteva AgriScience. Joining me on the phone today is Lindy Love, Strategic Account Manager in Northern California for Corteva AgriScience. Lindy, let's start with almonds. What diseases should producers watch for this season? Tree nut growers at this time probably are going to be looking for um, signs of shot hole, jacket rot, and anthracnose. With the rainfall events that we've had, um, that's probably what they're going to be monitoring for at this point. And what about for grapes? Um Right now, still seeing the usual suspects. Um, you know, grape growers are just getting going. Um, I know the Lodi area has already had bud break. Um, starting to see some in Sonoma, Napa County. Um, so they're probably gearing up to start their fungicide programs. Uh, typically for the grapes early on in the season, they're trying to get coverage for uh, powdery mildew. Now, just a reminder for some things that we discussed previously on the Fungicide Resistance Management Minute, why is it important to be paying attention to the FRAC group? So it's important so that you're rotating the chemistries. If you do uh, consecutive applications with the same group, you can actually have a the disease or the pathogen build resistance, and then it'll produce a new generation of pathogens that are going to keep continuing to be more resistant where eventually you lose that mode of action or that chemistry. So typically growers or the PCA will come up with a tentative program for the season. And then as the season goes and there's weather conditions, rain, humidity, you know, for a pathogen to actually occur, there has to be the pathogen present, the host available, and then also um, the correct conditions. So all three, all three of those have to be present for the pathogen to keep reproducing. But basically, the grower needs to, or the PCA through the season, adjust the program as necessary so they can target a specific disease, um, whether that's, you know, changing, they have a tentative plan and changing it or adjusting it as necessary through the season. Lindy, where can folks get more information about all of this? So growers could actually contact their local Corteva AgriScience representative or visit corteva.us backslash fungicide resistance. Thank you, Lindy. This has been the Fungicide Resistance Management Minute brought to you by Corteva AgriScience. The USDA released two huge reports on Thursday. The first was the quarterly U.S. Grains Stocks Report. The second, the Prospective Plantings Report. C.J. Miller joins us now with a look at how those reports impacted the grain markets. Thank you, Sabrina. Carl Setzer with Consus Ag Consulting joins me now. And Carl, the reports were bullish for corn futures, causing a bit of a rally on Thursday afternoon after those reports were released. Yeah, the acreage number is what really got corn moving, CJ. USDA and the Ag Outlook Forum had predicted corn acres at 91 million. Average trade estimate, 91.8 million. Last year, U.S. farmers planted 94.6 million acres of corn. Today's data, 90 million even. So right at the bottom of the estimate range, below what trade was expecting and well below last year. And that really got the market moving, especially with traders heavily short that corn complex. We're still, you know, 250,000 contracts short by the managed money crowd. So that data alone is what really caused corn to rally. And with the grain markets closed on Friday, could this corn rally continue Monday and into the first week of April, Carl? It definitely could. But next week when we get back, I wouldn't be too surprised if we don't see a little bit of risk premium added to this market. Whether we remain dry across several portions of the United States, especially the key growing areas, And uh, forecasts are bringing precipitation, but it's not what you would call huge volumes of rainfall. I think we start to see corn maybe not rally. I'm not saying, you know, we go to six, seven dollars by any means. But boy, to see us start creeping back up to that five dollar mark, definitely a possibility. Carl Setzer with Consus Ag Consulting. You can check out his website, C-O-N-S-U-S-A-G dot net. I'm C.J. Miller. 
and one of those prospective plantings reports was from cotton. Becky Summers with USDA has more information. Growers intended to plant 10.7 million acres of all cotton across the United States, which is up 4% from the previous year. Cotton producers in Georgia expect to plant an estimated 1.1 million acres, down 1% from the previous year. Alabama forecasts a 13% increase in planting this year at 430,000 acres of cotton. In Florida, the cotton planting forecast is set at 90,000 acres, a 1% increase from 2023. This is Becky Summer with the USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Cindy Zimmerman has today's national spotlight. I am speaking with Senator Chuck Grassley, and we just they just met with members of the American Coalition for Ethanol, and you have been probably the greatest supporter of ethanol in the last couple of decades, at least, if not four or five. Why is ethanol so important to you? Well, 58,000 jobs in Iowa on biofuels. Uh, it's good for agriculture. It's good for the environment. It's good for good-paying jobs in rural America. It's good for our national defense when you don't have to be uh, on imported eth- energy. Uh, and everything about it is good, good, good. There's, you don't find anything wrong with ethanol. And nobody can find any fault. I mean, I hear people all the time complaining about ethanol, but it's all coming out as I- ignorance from my standpoint. Well, we certainly made a lot of progress in the last couple of decades, but uh, we have right now a lot of a lot of opportunities in front of ethanol for sustainable aviation fuel. If we can get the discrete model right, what are your feelings right now of, as far as that delay is concerned? Well, it's a sad commentary because the uh, delay, as far as the formula is concerned, is based on ignorance. When you have this indirect land uh, factor in the formula. Mm-hmm. Uh, And it's also based on an ironic situation in which environmentalists want to clean up the environment. And uh, commercial airlines is putting a lot of pollution in the air. And then they think that they need advanced aviation fuel. And uh, then they uh, want it to come from renewable stock uh, that is is non-grained. And you can't produce enough. Uh, aviation fuel that way. So the inconsistency just is not understandable. You got to have grain, meaning soybeans and and uh, corn into that formula if you're going to produce enough aviation fuel that's uh, environmentally better. Finally, uh, E15. What are our chances of having your round E15? When we get, this is a short answer to your question, when we get big oil and ethanol on the same uh, highway that it was with the RFS in 2007. We are hoping it's happening, and it looks like it's moving in that direction, but I got to see it actually happen. And uh, then I presume we're going to have to fight environmentalists at that point. They want clean energy, and they they can get it if we uh, get E15 and uh, less dependent on fossil fuels, you know, but and and do they realize that grain is renewable as well? Just as renewable as wind. Well, it is a pleasure to, to speak with you here. We all appreciate your work here. And here at the American Coalition for Ethanol's annual fly in, I'm Cindy Zimmerman. That's today's national spotlight. Now here's today's livestock report. Will consumer demand for beef stay strong in the face of ever higher beef prices? Gary Crawford looks into it. A record high number of cattle placed into feedlots in February. The USDA reporting placements at about 1.9 million head, up 10 percent from February a year ago. USDA livestock analyst Mike McConnell says most folks were not expecting that large of an increase, but consider this. In January, we actually had a relatively low placement number. Uh, That was due to the winter storms that we had across the Midwest that, that came in early January, which delayed some of those placements. So uh, some of the increase uh, that we saw in placements during February was the fact that 
Uh, we were making up for some of the weather incidents that occurred during January. Putting feedlot placements up at historical levels also, according to Mike. Prices for feeder cattle are also very strong, uh, but they're also at historic uh, levels. During February at Oklahoma City, prices for 750 to 800 pound cattle averaging 241 a hundredweight. It was only 184 during February last year, so obviously... There's a lot of opportunity for cow-calf operators to, you know, market their their feeder cattle and, you know, get a good return on those animals that that they're taking off pasture or or taking off winter wheat uh, pasture and and placing them into feedlots. Now there's there's good returns for it Um, as, you know, there's also still relatively robust demand for for beef um, in the country. But will consumer demand go down as beef prices continue to go up? We're at the point in the season now we're being a transition on the beef demand side towards the summer grilling season. So, you know, a lot about what we see happening in, in the cattle and beef markets um, in the next couple uh, weeks and months is largely going to be predicated on how consumers respond, um, what kind of beef demand we get and how that works its way back through the system. So, yeah, so I think that's that's what we'll be paying attention to the next couple of weeks and months as we prepare our forecast. And I, I imagine the market is going to be doing the same. Mike is pretty sure about one forecast, and that is for continued contraction of the beef herd as producers keep selling heifers instead of holding on to them for breeding. And so um, it's probably going to be at least another year or two down the line before we see, see the, the numbers start to indicate expansion. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There's been some difficult weather around the nation this year. And as USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says, pastures and rangelands in some places are still having trouble. We do have a couple of states coming in with a significant portion of the pasture and range rated very poor to poor, led by Montana, the current number there, 52 percent. We have the potential freeze damage, but also the ongoing chronic drought in parts of Montana leading to those lower pasture and range conditions. Same thing is true in parts of the deep south. We have had recovery from drought, but we're still waiting for warm enough weather and sustained growth of those drought-affected rangeland and pastures. Texas coming in this week at 42%, very poor to poor. And again, that is really a reflection of what happened last year more than what's going on now. That said, we still have some pockets of drought in Texas We've also been dealing with the recent wildfires in the northern panhandle. So a few challenges in the south as well as we uh, head into this 2024 growing season. This is the AgNet Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's AgNet West headlines, here's AgNet West Farm News Director Brian German. The Kalosha Standards Board approval of the Indoor Heat Illness Standard has created a whole host of questions. Director of Employment Policy for California Farm Bureau Brian Little explained the uncertainty surrounding the rule. The Department of Finance, at the last minute, withdrew their approval of the standardized regulatory impact analysis for the proposed indoor heat illness standard that the College of Standards Board had intended to consider and approve last Thursday. So the result of that is the Standards Board was not even going to consider it. Then a few things happened. We had this protest. We had a lot of other things happen in the meantime. And the Standards Board eventually decided to go ahead and vote for the proposed standard. But the problem with that is they do not have the necessary regulatory procedure approvals to be able to approve that regulation. And I believe that means that their action is not valid. But nobody knows that for certain right now. And of course, for agriculture, the problem is employers where you have employees who move between indoor employment and outdoor employment throughout the course of the day. And how do you shoehorn this new indoor standard for employees who come and go, who do things like drive tractors and pick up trucks and work in three-sided packing sheds? And as of today, I don't really know what to tell those employers to do because we don't know what the agency might come up with next. Driscoll's has been recognized by Fast Company as one of the world's most innovative companies of 2024. Fast Company identified operations that are driving progress around the world and across industries, evaluating thousands of submissions through a competitive application process. The results a global guide to innovation today from early stage startups to some of the most valuable companies in the world. 
For more than 100 years, Driscoll's has been on a mission to provide consumers with unprecedented berry flavors while maintaining their trusted brand reputation, becoming one of America's most beloved retail brands. The most innovative companies list is available online and in print and signifies the trends and advancements shaping the innovation economy. Fast Company will further celebrate honorees at the Most Innovative Companies Summit and Gala on May 16th, which will provide insights into cutting-edge business trends and the future of innovation in 2024. As part of an overall effort to improve transparency in the food supply chain, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is launching the Farmer Seed Liaison Initiative. The purpose of the initiative is to promote competition in the seed industry while helping to support farmers, seed companies, and independent plant breeders. As part of this initiative, the Agricultural Marketing Service has announced the launch of a nationwide website monitoring program focused on Federal Seed Act compliance. Specialists will review seed company websites and marketing materials to ensure compliance with enforcement following a risk-based approach. USDA plans to increase outreach efforts, including webinars, to educate producers about labeling requirements. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack emphasized the importance of transparency and accountability in seed marketing, aiming to provide more options for farmers and promote competition in the industry. Establishing cover crops and vineyards can provide a variety of different benefits depending on how they're implemented. Vice President of Matoyan Brothers LLC, Richard Matoyan, explained the cover cropping goal they have for their table grapes. On the green varieties, one of the issues is the fact that light reflects off the bare soil back up into the canopy, causing the green grapes to get a little bit of yellowing. And that is downgraded by the buyers and by consumers. They want a grass green color. So my thought or my belief is if I plant the cover crop in a a small patch in the middle of the row, it's going to either reduce or eliminate that light reflection off the ground. Of course, the additional benefit is I'd be planting a cover crop and I'd be increasing the soil health. But for us, the primary reason would be to reduce that light reflection. Scholarship opportunities are available for students planning to enter the agricultural workforce. Executive Board Member for the Western Region Certified Crop Advisor Program, Aaron Wingate, explained some of the details of their scholarship program. So the Western Region Certified Crop Advisors are offering four $1,000 scholarships to college students in the Western Region. And those four scholarships go to uh, students in the Arizona, California desert area, the coastal region of California, California Northern Valley is the third, and the Southern Valley is the fourth. The applications are open online now for students. They can go to www.wrcca.org slash scholarships. And the applications are open online until May 10th. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Is the nation headed for a rough hurricane season? That's coming up on This Land of Ours. The meteorologists at AccuWeather are warning people and businesses to start preparing now for what could be a busy tropical storm season that may have major impacts on the United States. The 2024 Atlantic hurricane season forecast is calling for 20 to 25 named storms. 8 to 12 of those storms are forecast to strengthen into hurricanes. 4 to 6 storms could directly impact the U.S. AccuWeather lead hurricane forecaster Alex De Silva says the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season is forecast to feature well above the historical average number of tropical storms, hurricanes, major hurricanes, and direct U.S. impacts. Warmer ocean temperatures are one of the factors that can provide fuel for tropical systems to rapidly intensify into powerful hurricanes. Sea surface temperatures are well above historical averages across much of the Atlantic Basin. Remember, if you've missed any of our morning shows or if you just want to catch the news at a time that's convenient for you, you can subscribe to our podcast and have statewide agriculture news at your convenience. Just search for the Agnet News Hour on your favorite podcast downloading app. That's Agnet News Hour and it's available on both Android and Apple devices. This is the Agnet News Hour. Now here's Chuck Zimmerman. At Commodity Classic, I'm visiting with Rex Gray. And first of all, Rex, tell me what you do. Hey, Rex Gray, Corn Product Manager for Golden Harvest and GHX. Well, we are here at a record-breaking uh, attendant uh, commodity classic, so you're going to have a lot of corn farmers around here, I know, and that's your area. So tell us, first of all, what, what's the like, number one thing you'd like them to know when they come visit with you? 
Yeah, so excited to be here at Commodity Classic. Excited to also support the NCGA winners from a corn perspective. So uh, excited to have a lot of winners that were utilizing Golden Harvest products uh, to, to win those uh, contests over the past year. As we think about Golden Harvest and from a corn perspective, made a lot of innovation over the past 50 years. So as we think about that, it's really focused on three things. Number one, speed. Number two, precision. And number three, power. So as we think about the Golden Harvest corn innovation, uh, again, thinking about speed, you know, one of the things that we've been able to do from a corn standpoint uh, since 2019 is have a 3x increase uh, in the number of parents that make up those hybrids. What does that mean for corn farmers? It really means we've got more new genetics, more new hybrids coming to the market, which gives an opportunity to make more money. Um, as we think about precision and, and how those products are going to be placed and know what those products are, we've expanded our testing footprint 30%. Uh, we've upgraded our combine fleet. We've upgraded our planter fleet. So that's going to allow us to get uh, better data, more insights to help us make decisions uh, and help ensure that those products can be placed uh, correctly in, in the fact that uh, in the coming year. And so lastly, as we think about power, uh, you look specifically at Golden Harvest um, you know, and those pre-commercial trials and, and products. Uh, it, just in the last couple of years, we've had a 10x increase in the number of those products uh, since 2019. And so for Golden Harvest, GHX, what does that mean? It means over the past two years, we brought 39 new products to the market. So uh, excited about the Golden Harvest corn portfolio, uh, excited the, about what we brought to the market, but also excited to continue to partner with farmers and help them become more profitable. And it's amazing that, you know, you're using that 2019 year and yet that next year and a half especially was was rough, but not necessarily for what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah, we all went through uh, experience challenges in, in that time period. But from a Syngenta R&D standpoint, continuing to invest in that space, continuing to, to move the um, move forward. And as we think about that, that's exactly what our corn lineup has done over the past couple of years, continuing to uh, invest in the trade technology space, just launched uh, or opened a, a new facility down um, in R2P, $18 million in sectory. And so from that standpoint, really thinking about uh, how can we control corn rootworm, uh, fall armory worm. So those are the, the two key pests that we're um, you know, working on right now, obviously working on a lot of d other insects as well, but continuing to invest in that space from an innovation standpoint. Uh, as we think about innovation, uh, also this year excited to launch Engine Duricade Viptera. So that's something that farmers have told us that they've wanted and needed for some time. Uh, excited to bring that to the market this coming year with the most comprehensive insect control uh, trade in the marketplace. Uh, so again, a lot of excitement around Golden Harvest and GHX, not only this year, but also in the future. Well, it's been... 50 years of this, right? Yeah, a long legacy and continuing to uh, be excited, continuing to invest in that space to make sure, that, again, that we're helping farmers make uh, more money, more bushels each year, not only this year, but also in the future. Anything else you want to tell these corn growers that are going to be coming by to visit with you that we didn't touch on? really as we think about you know what Syngenta um, has, has done in the corn space, continuing to invest uh, in facilities, continue to invest in, in people, and continuing to make sure that we're able to bring um, trait technologies and germplasm to growers to help them meet the needs um, of their growing operations and ultimately help them produce more bushel, which is going to put more money in their pocket. All right, well, thank you very much, Rex, for visiting with me here. We are at the 2024 Commodity Classic. I'm Chuck Zimmerman reporting. Why do we color eggs and then hide them from view? Why do bunnies do home delivery of eggs and other foods? Gary Crawford has this report. Stand-up comedian Jim Gaffigan sometimes talks about the origins of holidays and such. And uh, he has a, a little routine in which he says, you know, centuries ago people are sitting around, what should we do for spring, they said. What should we do for Easter? And the answer came to them in a flash. How about eggs? Well, that makes no sense. All right, we'll hide them. Ah, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Well, there is a logical connection there. Agriculture Department uh, history expert Ann Eflin says since Easter got its start, actually centuries before Christianity as a celebration of, of spring and new life and fertility, it's only natural that eggs, also a symbol of that, should come into things fairly early on. For example... The Persians and Egyptians actually exchanged eggs that were decorated in spring colors as a way of celebrating the spring. The early Christians sort of adopted that 
And here is a story that Anne ran across, an obscure story that may play into this. Simon of Cyrene, who helped carry the cross for, uh, with Jesus, was an egg merchant. And when he returned home after the uh, event, all of his hen's eggs had turned colors into rainbow colors. Which would also help to explain why we decorate eggs. And connected with eggs very closely, of course. There's a bunny. <laughs> Here comes Peter Cottontail. Yes, we have the Easter Bunny coming into this, an ancient German tradition. The German story is that there was a poor woman who had decorated eggs for her family to find during a famine. And that I think they were to sort of identify which were their eggs, and they had to search for them and find them. They found this nest of eggs and looked up. They saw a rabbit hopping away, and that's how they decided the rabbit had brought the eggs. This evolved into a tradition in which kids would hide their hats and bonnets around the house and supposedly a bunny would leave eggs in them. But as the years have worn on, some of these Easter traditions have, of course, been commercialized. And so we've gone from real eggs and baskets to candy eggs and jelly beans and chocolate rabbits. The transition from eggs to candy seems to have been the result of an advertising campaign near the end of the 1800s by a European candy company as a means of selling their candy Easter eggs. So they encouraged people to buy candy representations of eggs and then of course it goes into all sorts of candy and now we give candy and gifts and all sorts of other stuff. And of course we have one other tradition. In your Easter bonnet you'll be the grandest lady in the Easter parade. That would I assume be uh, something that grew out of this tradition of buying and wearing new clothes on Easter Sunday, you know, which apparently came about at about the same time as that transition to candy. So those are the origins of some of our special traditions of the season. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <laughs> This is the Agnet News Hour, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. In this week's Almond Matters, brought to you by Valent USA, growers have been busy with disease management programs ahead of the rain. We're joined once again by Todd Berkdahl this morning, field market development specialist with Valent USA. And Todd, we're here at the tail end of March now, and so just wanted to check in with you and um, hear about what you've been seeing out in almond orchards and uh, how the trees have been faring through the spring here. Ironically, I'm out looking. I was looking at almonds all this morning, so uh, things are progressing. We're well past petal fall now, probably a week or so, ten days past petal fall uh, for most varieties um, in the South Valley and in the central part of the valley. People are out there spraying almonds for. Petal fall sprays, those, those, most of those have taken place already. So the next net round of applications will come up here in a week or so. For rust and scab and, you know, alternate areas right around the corner. So, um, you know, if you had pressure last year, probably a good idea to, to uh, reinforce the program this year with, a, with an earlier start, you know, ounce of preventions. Heard that for me before, you keep hearing it. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, getting on these blocks early, especially high density blocks or d blocks that have a history of alternate area and rust. Last year, rust, we haven't seen rust in a while and last year because of the wet weather, we saw rust. I would probably think that we're gonna see some more rust this year just because we're gonna have, we had a rain event just a few days ago. We're gonna have another one for this weekend. So things are staying pretty moist as far as canopies and let go and keeping, keeping those uh, organisms viable. Most of them require some type of moisture to, to be activated. So getting the fungicide on right now is a good time. A quash works really good for, I'll put a chime in for quash here. Quash works really good for alternaria and rust, you know, starting early. And again, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So getting that quash on now is a good is a good time. And following it up with something else, for, uh, possibly PhD or in a couple of weeks, then come back with another quash in around the middle, latter part of April. And with that moisture that's been out there and um, some rain expected again here coming up, uh, what sort of impact might that have on applications and uh, timing? Well, it depends on, <clears throat> depends on when you put your last application on. If you put an application on two weeks ago and you get a rain event, you know, three or four days or say 15, 20 days afterwards, it's probably a good idea as soon as you can to, to put another application on as, as soon as you can get back in the orchard or ideally put it on before the rain event. Um, you know, unless it's a contact material that washes off, but most of the most fungicides at this point are not 
are not, they don't wash off. They go in and do what they're supposed to do. So putting on something either right before or right after a rain event is usually good insurance. I mean, you know, Brian, with any disease, you know, you've got the environment, the host, the almond tree, the, the environment, the conditions, the weather conditions, and then the pathogen. And so uh, if all those things, all those three of those things are lined up, your potential is really, really high to get to get disease. So I would say this year, the environment is conducive. Uh, you can't do anything to eliminate the host because that's the almond trees. Of course, there's been a few almond trees, a lot of almond trees taken out because of the cost of price to almonds and issues, economic issues otherwise. But, um, and the pathogen is always going to be there. It's always going to be viable. It just needs the right, right environment to grow in. So I would say, yes, we're going to have potentially high pressure year for both Alton area and rust. Yeah, and just as a uh, as a recap here, what kind of problems can alternaria and rust create in orchards uh, if growers aren't working to uh, try and get out in front of them? Well, you <clears throat> run the risk of defoliation. You know, left unchecked, alternaria will. I've seen orchards completely defoliated. You know, way you know <laughs> before you want them to be defoliated. You want them to defoliate after you harvest and going into the fall, not in the middle of the summer. So uh, rust is the same thing. The leaves get infected. And they're no longer viable and, and they die and fall off. So that's the risk. It also takes away from, you know, any infection, those leaves are factories for your crop. Okay. They're, they're, they're the factory that's producing the phytonutrients, uh, photosynthates that are accumulating in the leaves are transferred to the, to the nuts. So if you don't have a good canopy or a, a canopy that's compromised from disease, your quality of nut, not only this year, but next year will be uh, affected. So you got to keep that in mind. You keep the trees healthy and you know your crop will be uh, healthy as well. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Thank you, Brian. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Now for more news, maple syrup from Canada is in high demand. Dennis Sky reports. Quebec's Maple Syrup Producers Association has plans to release about half of its strategic reserve inventory this year to meet increasing export demand. The strategic reserve, located about two hours northeast of Montreal, is the world's only commercial stockpile of maple syrup, with a storage capacity of about 150 million pounds of maple syrup. Central Canada's industry has not had a really good sap run since 2020, and while this year's syrup season is not quite finished, producers like Jamie Fortune say the mild weather does not bode well. Milder weather, lower sugar in the sap, warm spells, all those things, they're pushing down on production. So it's unlikely that there's going to be a bumper crop. The Quebec Producers Association says that while its plans will draw reserve inventory down severely, meeting export demand for authentic maple syrup has to be maintained in the face of competition from cheaper maple-flavored corn syrup-based products. David Hall sits on the board of the Quebec Maple Syrup Strategic Reserve. The last few years have seen severe cold snaps within generally mild winter weather across much of North North America's maple tree region. And according to David Hall, such erratic temperatures disrupt sap flow and sugar quality. It was bad from Wisconsin to Nova Scotia. We just had an abnormal period for sap quality and doesn't produce the same level as normal. You need below freezing at night and above freezing during the day. In our case, it was more the sugar content that we were receiving as opposed to the volume. Across up of that, we've had two years of 20% gain in sales. Quebec continues to dominate maple syrup production and export in North America. And while maple trees grow across southeastern Canada and the northeastern U.S., David Hall says that most of these regions see their trees primarily as a lumber source. Tapping the trees for sap damages the tree's lumber value. And as well, Hall says maple syrup production is just a far more complex process. There's a certain amount of expertise. The way we make syrup, you don't just strike out in the woods with a drill bit. There's a lot more to it. A lot of these places have a substantial amount of maple trees, but they have more of a logging mm -hmm. outlook. As soon as you start tapping a tree, the first eight feet loses its value for saw logs. Reporting from Canada. I'm Dennis Guy. The flow of cattle into feedlots is continuing at high levels. Here's Gary Crawford with more. A record high number of cattle placed into feedlots in February. 
The USDA reporting placements at about 1.9 million head, up 10 percent from February a year ago. USDA livestock analyst Mike McConnell says most folks were not expecting that large of an increase, but consider this. In January, we actually had a relatively low placement number. Uh, That was due to the winter storms that we had across the Midwest that, that came in early January, which delayed some of those placements. So uh, some of the increase uh, that we saw in placements during February was the fact that uh, we were making up for some of the weather incidents that occurred during January. Putting feedlot placements up at historical levels also, according to Mike. Prices for feeder cattle are also very strong, uh, but they're also at historic uh, levels. During February at Oklahoma City, prices for 750 to 800 pound cattle averaging 241 a hundredweight. It was only 184 during February last year, so obviously... There's a lot of opportunity for cow-calf operators to, you know, market their their feeder cattle and, you know, get a good return on those animals that that they're taking off pasture or or taking off winter wheat uh, pasture and and placing them into feedlots. Now there's there's good returns for it Um, as, you know, there's also still relatively robust demand for for beef um, in the country. But will consumer demand go down as beef prices continue to go up? We're at the point in the season now we're being a transition on the beef demand side towards the summer grilling season. So, you know, a lot about what we see happening in, in the cattle and beef markets um, in the next couple uh, weeks and months is largely going to be predicated on how consumers respond um, and what kind of beef demand we get and how that works its way back through the system. So, yeah, so I think that's that's what we'll be paying attention to the next couple of weeks and months as we prepare our forecast. And I imagine the market is going to be doing the same. Mike is pretty sure about one forecast, and that is for continued contraction of the beef herd as producers keep selling heifers instead of holding on to them for breeding. And so um, it's probably going to be at least another year or two down the line before we see, see the, the numbers start to indicate expansion. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A family's dream and community connections are behind efforts to produce and promote coffee from Hawaii from the perspective of a mother and daughter coffee growing team. Here's Rod Bain. A mother-daughter duo producing coffee on the island of Hawaii, part of a greater community creating greater economic and social opportunity. The connection, according to daughter Joan Obra, is her father Rusty. It was my father's personal mission to do everything that he could to help Kau Coffee grow. They did organize the Kau Coffee Growers Cooperative. Kau is a district on the Big Island, one that until recently was overshadowed in recognition for its coffee production by the Kona area. Mother Lori Obra says she and her late husband became a team operation on their small coffee plantation conducting experimentation on different varieties and production methods from their science backgrounds. I work with him side by side. I picked his mind. So I learned everything that he knows. In 2005, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. He passed on in 2006. I decided to run the farm. It was hard because there were two people working and now I'm by myself. Lori's prior career as a medical technician would prove significant as experiments and attention to detail on the farm continued and product from Rusty's Hawaiian became recognized. And Joan Obra says when it comes to the building of that district's coffee industry among her mother and Kau's producers. USDA has been really helpful with the different programs that have been available to farmers. Assistance that has included a USDA socially disadvantaged groups grant for technical assistance and development of a marketing plan for Kau's Coffee Cooperative. These are programs that we do either as an industry or as a section of the industry. And so in that way, they also really do help build community and cooperation. Through these efforts, Kau Coffee gained global recognition. In 2007, there were two farmers here from Kau who made top 10 in the world at what was then called the Coffees of the Year competition. So there was a buzz. Everyone was like, well, where is this Kau district? So 2009 is when things really started to take off. Two years later, Joan Obra and her husband would move to Hawaii and form their own coffee-based business, Isla Custom Coffees. Incidentally, when not operating her business, or helping her mom with Rusty's, Joan is grant writing for USDA awards on behalf of her coffee-producing colleagues in Kau. 
I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halbertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.